morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out today. I really appreciate it on a cold uh, winter's morning. Um, I was just going to tell you a story about one of butterflies and, and what they're doing and why they're doing and doing these things, and also a little bit about um, some of the problems that we're presenting one of butterflies. And if I've got time, right at the end, I'll just talk a little bit about some work, more recent work we've been doing in South America looking at monarch butterfly movement there and what's happening there, and the same kinds of threats. So this is my target, this is the monarch butterfly, it's familiar to all of you, um, a brightly colored insect. I hope you don't mind if I just wander up and down here. Um, I don't really like standing by a desk. Um, if you can't hear me, or you can't understand my funny accent, please let me know and I'll try and be a miracle. I've lived here a long time, but for some reason my voice doesn't change, I don't know why. Um, so this is what I'm going to do today. This is my outline. I'm just going to define what migration is. It sounds like a strange thing to do, that we should all know what migration is. But unfortunately, we don't. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, milkweeds and the resources that monarch butterflies are exploiting. So basically, this is what the butterflies are trying to do, is put their offspring onto milkweeds so that their offspring have got something to feed on. So that's a big problem for anybody. Um, we all, we're all looking for our resources, we all go to Myers or to a corner store to go and buy milk or beer or whatever, and we've got different quality resources, so we're making all these decisions. How do we move? Do we walk to the store or do we get in the car and go to the store? So monarch butterflies are doing exactly the same things. They're making these choices in time and space. And that's a major theme of what I'm talking about here is time and space and how they're solving those problems on a continental scale, and this seems fairly remarkable for an insect that is dealing with those kinds of scales. So I'm going to be looking at um, a couple of hypotheses that we tested. I'm just going to give you three sets of evidence that we collected to address those particular hypotheses to work out what monarchs are doing in time and space in relation to the diversity and distribution of these milkweed resources that their caterpillars are feeding on in North America. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that interest me, um, which is the variation in plant defenses, the chemicals that plants are producing. As you're aware, plants are rooted to the spot, so they're sitting ducks for anybody who wants to eat them. So what do plants do? This is your turn to, to interact with me. What do plants do? They've got toxins, yeah. They're sitting ducks, so they're rooted to the spot. All they can really do is make themselves prickly or taste terrible or be completely indigestible. So some of you like Brussels sprouts, some of you like broccoli. And the reasons for those differences are these chemical defenses. So um, defense is what has driven my interest in research um, for my whole career. So I, I, I just retired this summer, so I'm really happy and relaxed. <laughs> and every, and so um, I'm going to talk about these plant defenses, and then one of butterflies are brightly coloured. Looks like it's wearing brightly striped pyjamas, and this is a warning to natural enemies, predators, parasites, that it's toxic. And so this is what I mean by sequestration. They sequester these chemical defenses from the host plants and use them in their own defense against their natural enemies. And so I'm going to talk about the nature of the, the colour of one of butterflies and um, a little bit about about those issues. And then I'm going to shift, this is sort of basically um, my uh, work over the years looking at the biology of monarch butterflies. And then more recently, last year, I published a review of the threats to monarchs. I'm going to talk a little bit about those, a little bit about the mitigation of those threats. And then if I've got time, I'm just going to end by comparing monarchs here in North America with those in South America and some of the interesting differences in, in, in the Americas. So migration, this is a quote from a fairly recent book on animal migration, this book here. Um, this quote says, migration like fine art is something that everyone knows about, a subject on which everyone has a strong opinion, yet nobody can precisely define. That seems loony, doesn't it, in this day and age that we don't know what migration is. So we talk about human migrations, um, basically these diasporas that we're all a product of. Um, are not really migration, they're just one-way movements. It's range expansion, if you like. So these mass movements, I don't think, should be called migration. So migration is something that is predictable. And so I define migration as predictable movement between spatially separated resources. 
So you've got a resource here and a resource there. If something is moving backwards and forwards between them on a predictable basis, rather than randomly, then it's migration. So that's how I'm defining migration. And then, of course, uh, not everything is absolute in, in biology. And this is something that's... I've, I've taught ecology here for nearly 30 years. And it's something that has driven my students absolutely bonkers with frustration is in ecology, there are always caveats. There's always an exception. It's not like physics. You don't just give them string theory and that's it. Um, ecology is, is really frustrating to students, and I love it for that diversity. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. So just uh, in keeping with that, that frustration, um, most migrants are actually partial migrate, migrants in terms of the overall species. So blue jays here. Some of them migrate, some don't. Um, some chickadees move further south. So these are all examples of partial migrants. So monoclast flies are partial migrants in which there's a mixture of migratory and non-migratory life histories. And I like using this, um, this uh, British punk rock band, The Clash. I would play, play <laughs> a clip, but whenever I try, it always fails. So this song, Should I Stay or Should I Go? It's like, should I stay or should I go? And you, you just don't know that beautiful woman over there or the one that may be over here. So what do you do? And so um, this whole, these decisions that all organisms are making, whether it's about sex or food or whatever, are all related to your choice of actually moving or not. So um, what we've been doing um, for the last 30, um, 35 years is looking at monarch butterflies east of the Rocky Mountains and their movement from um, Mexico in the transvolcanic mountains um, where they spend the winter, and then how they locate milkweeds are distributed like this. So um, when I first came to live in, in the USA, I, went, I flew to Mexico City to meet Lincoln Brower, who was the most famous of monarch researchers, to work with him as a postdoc. And I flew to Mexico City and went to uh, Sierra Chinqua in the mountains to the overwintering site um, where we were camping and doing work on the monoclonal flies. So um, in our work, we were asking um, what happens in the spring, how do they find these milkweeds? So these are the distributions of this northern milkweed, which is the one you're so familiar with around here, the common milkweed, which has this very wide distribution throughout the Great Lakes and the Midwest. And then these are three very common southern milkweeds, Asclepius asperula, Asclepius virilis, and Asclepius unistrata distributed across the southern USA. So um, the butterflies are moving up into this dis these distributions here, and um, my definition of migration has been predictable movement between spatially separated resources are the overwintering resources of the oil milk um, fir forests here in Mexico, and the breeding resources of the milkweeds that the butterflies are trying to find, um, putting their larvae onto the milkweeds. Um, th this is just a picture of monarch butterflies all rising into the air on a sunny day in Mexico on the trees. This is a frontispiece of a book that I edited with my colleague in Australia. Um, so you're, you're aware of those dramatic scenes in, in Mexico where you could have 100 million butterflies in maybe four acres of forest, and so the trees are completely covered with the butterflies. So they spend the winter there. Um, I'm interested in, in how they're making the choices about all these food resources across North America. So this, this is a 1954 monograph of the genus Asclepius um, showing the distribution of 106 species in North America. There are actually about 130 species that have been described now in North America. So this is the resource the butterflies are trying to find in time and space. And um, there are different centers of diversity. So you have an Antillian center in, in the Greater Antilles, Cuba and Hispaniola and Puerto Rico. And, um, and then there are other centers, the Floridian down here, the Appalachian here, the Ozarkian here, the Mexican here, and the Californian here. And so these are separate floras of the genus Asclepius, a single genus of milkweed. And um, the butterflies are trying to decide which of these they're going to find in time and space. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the diversity of these different milkweeds. Um, so these milkweeds show very characteristic um, spatial distributions, but also very characteristic temporal distributions. As you know, climate is very different in the southern USA versus the northern USA. 
So if you go down to Texas in the early spring, in late March and April, you'll find in the cattle pastures of central Texas a really, really common milkweed. This one is Lucas viridis, the green milkweed. And um, this is, these are just distributions from uh, herbarium records um, showing this great abundance in Texas, Oklahoma, and places like that. So this appears really early um, from late March onwards. In the southeastern USA, you have this Piedmont species, Sleepus illustrata, which if any of you are snowbirds and go down to Florida in January, um, you'll probably see this start appearing in early March if you hang around that long. And so this plant is very common in these sand regions of Florida. And so this is also from the end of March. And then later in the year, from the end of May onwards, you've got the common milkweed up here. So this is our milkweed, if you like, the super abundant milkweed in the Great Lakes region. And so this is um, a tremendous resource throughout the Great Lakes. So what we did was we were asking, you know, what are these butterflies doing in time and space? Are they leaving Mexico and flying slowly north and the females are depositing eggs all the way up to the northernmost distribution of, of milkweed, um, or, so it's just north of the Great Lakes, or do they leave Mexico and arrive in the southern USA, lay their eggs and die, and then their offspring continue the migration war. So we call this strategy a signal sweep migration strategy, and this one a successive brood migration strategy. So we wanted to collect evidence that would allow us to discriminate between those two hypotheses. And so the, um, the three sets of evidence that we collected were, first of all, to do the obvious thing, which is just to go out in the field with the monarch butterflies and watch them and collect data on what they're doing and see what happens. So we met the monarch butterflies at the, at the Mexican-Texas border and then drove slowly north with them. So my wife and I, we had a, an NSF grant and rented a Winnebago for three months and just drove with the butterflies all the way up to the Canadian border. So from these data, from these field surveys, you can work out in degree days, so you can integrate time and temperature by looking at the abiotic constraints that influence what the butterflies are doing. Obviously, if you arrive too early in the southern USA, it's still cold, and so you can't do anything. So you've got to get your timing right. So the butterflies typically arrive at the end of March, beginning of April, and then they start laying eggs because the milkweeds are there. If there's a frost, as happens here in Michigan very often at the end of May, there's usually a frost the first week of June here in Kalamazoo. Um, if they get here, the milkweeds get killed, and there's nothing for them to exploit. And so it's a, it's a tricky timing um, exercise they've got to solve. So we calculated in degree days. So when we go out in the field, we search um, thousands and thousands of milkweed stems, look for monarch immatures, eggs. The monarchs have five larval stages called instars, so you've got little caterpillars and big caterpillars, then they pupate, and then the adult emerges from the pupa. So you've got those five larval stages, and you record which instar the larva is on a particular milkweed at a particular time. And then you can use the local regional weather records to calculate in degree days back to when that was laid by the female as the egg. And then you can calculate in degree days forward to when that was going to emerge as an adult. And then in degree days, how long it's going to take that adult to mature eggs and produce the next generation. So from that, if you find a fifth instar larva, and that's the oldest larva that you find on milkweed, you know that that is likely to be very close to the first arrival on that milkweed. So you can calculate to when that was laid as the egg. So we can work out the first arrivals, and then we can also work out the main cohort by looking at the distribution of immatures that arrive at a particular location. So using this integration of time and temperature, we can work out using days to mature for the um, larvae as a measure of performance of different areas in North America we can work out a pattern of what the butterflies are doing. And I'll come back to that and explain it a bit more. Then, um, because I'm a nerdy chemical ecologist, and for some reason I like chemistry, um, these milkweeds, we have 130 species of Asclepias, they have chemical defenses called cardenolides in them, which are toxic steroids. But each milkweed has a characteristic array of these toxic steroids. So some of them can have as many as 60 different cardenolides in them 
all targeting the same receptor in natural enemies. They target sodium potassium ATPases. So that, that's really fundamental to every animal on the planet. This is an enzyme that controls sodium and potassium flux in every cell in your body. So if you take some of this, it makes you vomit. And if you persist, it makes your heart beat stronger until it beats, it stops its system. So these are pretty potent toxins. And if, if you get beyond that point and you haven't died, then it starts disrupting every system in your body, your nervous conduction, your kidneys, your liver, everything. So these are nasty poisons. And this is what the butterflies are sequestering from the milkweeds to use in their own defenses, which again I'll come back to. So that's what I mean by these cut like being prints, and I'll show you examples of that. And then wing wear is an obvious thing to do for um, some, something that's moving long distances. Um, you're going to get pretty beaten up. And so that's some measure of age and also perhaps distance travel. So starting with wing wear, if you look at the uh, southern arrivals in, in Texas in the early spring, you can see these butterflies are pretty beaten up. Whereas if you look at um, Wisconsin arrivals in the first week of June, they're much more pristine. So taking these kinds of data and um, uh, presenting them like this as a measure of wind condition here uh, against space, against latitude, and against time over here, you can see that for both space and for time, you have this separation of these butterflies. So they're um, becoming, these are fresh butterflies, they're becoming more and more worn as you move through time. So these, this represents overwintered butterflies that have arrived in the southern USA and get progressively more worn. And then these are their offspring. So these start off really fresh and gradually become more worn with latitude as you move further north because they're flying further to get there. And then the same thing with time. As you move through time, they're becoming more worn. So these are two separate populations of butterflies. So these are the offspring of these. And then if you look at the uh, degree days to the days to maturity, and you look at time and space here, and put them together three-dimensionally here, this is days to maturity, this is overposition dates, so this is early in the spring, this is um, much later in the spring, early summer, and this is down in the southern USA, and this is um, Wisconsin, Michigan, places like that. And you can see that these days to maturity of this axis here fall into these two clusters. So these, again, are the uh, butterflies that have been produced by the overwintered butterflies. And then these ones are produced by these ones. And these take longer to mature, furthermore, later in the season. So our wing wear and our field surveys all corroborated the successive um, uh, sweep hypothesis of migration. So butterflies from Mexico fly to the southern USA and lay their eggs and die, and then their offspring continue the migration to the Great Lakes region. And then we also, um, um, my wife Barbara, um, she um, built a little simple abiotic model of these day, uh, degree day accumulations for the butterflies at different um, latitudes. So this is in the southern tip of Florida, Gainesville in North Central Florida, Asheville, North Carolina, Dayton, Ohio, and St. Croix Falls, Wisconsin here. And basically, these black bars represent monarch generations in degree days. So this is this integrating time and temperature at these different latitudes here. So the southern tip of Florida, it's surprisingly benign. Um, it's not super hot during the summer, and um, it's not too cold during the winter. And so the butterflies, probably breed all year round. And these other bars here are various constraints, abiotic constraints of the butterflies, things like day length. Day length is the most reliable cue on the planet for all organisms, practically everywhere except the tropics where it's not, not too much of a big deal. And in temperate regions, day length is the most predictable cue that you can possibly use to determine what you're going to do for the onset of behaviors that deal with things like temperature. Um, so these are all different kinds of constraints. And so basically what this is doing is it's creating a window of opportunity that becomes narrower and narrower as you move further north. So the window of opportunity obviously is in spring and summer, and that's when you see the breeding of the butterflies at each of these latitudes. 
And as you move further north, you can see you're constraining the number of generations you can fit in. In Sunset, Florida, they can breed probably all the year round, no, no constraints. You move to north central Florida, and it becomes lethally hot in the summer. And this represents death for the larvae. If there are larvae there, they will be killed by hot temperatures. Anything above 33 degrees Celsius kills the larvae. And the milkweeds also disappear. disappear. So there's no point in staying in the southern USA for this particular insect, because all the milkweeds will be gone, and your larvae will die. And so you have to move out of the southern USA, um, otherwise you're a goner. Um, but the sun tip of Florida, because you've got the, the Gulf of Mexico and ocean breezes, um, uh, then the, you, you, you can probably breed all year round. And you're basically not a migrant. So you're not really relevant to this particular story. So um, again, we, we compared data for two locations. Um, we compared Florida and Wisconsin data. And this represents eggs, first instar larvae, second and third instar larvae, and fourth and fifth instar larvae. And it's a bit of a hard thing to see, but you can see here in Florida, there are three egg peaks here at two different locations. And the same in Wisconsin, these are Wisconsin data. So Wisconsin obviously is going to be later because it takes the butterflies a while to get to Wisconsin. So these are all much later in time, and these peaks here. But you can see these three peaks of eggs disappear when you get to the late instar larvae. So these late instar larvae die because of the onset of really hot temperatures above this line up here in, in the summer in, in Gainesville. Um, whereas in Wisconsin, all three generations of larvae survive produce three generations of butterflies in the north. So it makes complete sense for the butterflies to fly all the way up to the Great Lakes region because they can complete three generations there, which is a big deal, whereas you only complete one generation in the south. So um, to get to the nerdy bit about the chemistry, um, th this is a thin layer chromatogram which sort of illustrates these kind of like fingerprints. So this is a glass plate covered with silica gel and what I've done is I've extracted butterflies and put the extract along this point here, the origin, and then I've run up a solvent mix up, up the plate which separates the steroids in the butterfly. And then I've visualized those steroids with a particular um, organic compound which is specific to these cardenolides. It makes blue spots called the mycin complexes. And these are all blue if I photograph this in color. So these are all blue spots. And you can see that these three butterflies here were reared on Asclepius exaltata from Virginia. These three on Asclepius humistrata from Florida. These three from North Dakota and Minnesota on Asclepius sirica. And these three in the south in Florida on Asclepius viridis. And you can see within each of these panels, the fingerprint is pretty consistent. And so we can compare this fingerprint with this fingerprint with this fingerprint this fingerprint and say which um, uh, milkweed species the caterpillar fed on as a larva um, based on what the chemicals are in the adult butterflies. So using those fingerprints allows us to describe the use of milkweeds in time and space. And these are just examples of what these chemicals are that they're sequestering. So this is a standard digitoxin, it actually comes from foxgloves. So um, you probably know about foxgloves used in human heart therapy. There was a doctor in England in the 18th century called William Withering who realized that you could give patients very tiny amounts of powdered foxglove leaves and if their heart was beating very weakly or fibrillating, it would make their heart beat more strongly and would be very therapeutic. If you gave them too much, they'd drop them dead. So okay. it's a very risky <laughs> thing to do and there's been um, 200 years of research into these chemicals for their therapeutic uses, but they're also a tremendous defense for the monarch butterflies that sequestered from milkweeds and for milkweeds to use against, say, deer eating those particular plants. So you've got digitoxygenin here, um, is this compound, um, and uh, a species side is this spot here in the common milkweed. Um, this is uh, extremely polar which is something that interests me because it's got all these hydroxyl groups in it and a sugar with lots of hydroxyl groups. So this is a sugar, this is the steroid of moiety. 
So um, when you're looking at the butterflies from different locations, so overwintering butterflies in Mexico, we analyzed 386 from there. Um, the, the eastern USA migrants in the southern USA, 133 and 629 from the northern USA, um, you find that 92% of the butterflies spending the winter in Mexico had fed on Asclepia soriaca, which is the, the super abundant common milkweed up here in the Great Lakes. And it, when you look at the sudden arrivals in the, in the southern USA, you see that 84% of them have fed on that same milkweed. So these are butterflies that have fed on the common milkweed around here in Michigan um, in, the, in the late summer, flown to Mexico, spent the winter in Mexico, and then flown back to the southern USA. So these ones in Mexico, these are the ones in the southern USA, so in, in, in Texas. And then when we look at the butterflies that arrive in the north with much fresher wings, as I showed you just now, 84% of them have fed on Asclepias viridis, the superabundant milkweed in the cattle pastures of Texas and Oklahoma, and places like that. So we think this is pretty strong evidence for this successive brood migration by monarch butterflies shown by these um, milkweed fingerprints. So uh, these, uh, one of the reasons why I came here from England was that Kalamazoo happens to be right in the middle of the distribution of the common milkweed. And the common milkweed, I think, is the most interesting milkweed in the world. Nothing comes close to it for its evolutionary sophistication and the ecological interest that this plant has. So if you look at southern milkweeds, the Sleepers of in the hill country of Texas, or in Florida, or um, uh, Asclepius viridis in Florida, or the sandhill milkweed, Asclepius strata in Florida, you can see that most of these milkweeds show what I call um, constrained modularity. So modularity is just a reflection of how many modules there are in the plant. Um, as you know, we're unitary organisms. So if I chopped off Paul's arm and stuck it in the ground, it's not going to root and grow a new Paul. <laughs> so um, we're a unitary organism. We're non-modular, if you like. We have a single modular. Whereas lots of plants, as you know, like willow trees or aspen, um, they're all connected underground, and so an aspen forest is basically all one individual. And so there's a lot of debate about what is an individual when you look at organisms. Dan Jansen published the famous paper where he, he asked that question, and he said that dandelions and aphids, it's not the individual dandelion or the individual aphid you're looking at, it's the whole colony. Even though they're not joined, because they reproduce asexually, they're all identical. So they're all modules of the same organism. So it starts to get quite hard to decide what is an organism. These species are fairly easy because their modularity is constrained by having a thing like a carrot on the ground, and all the stems radiate out from that. And that's what constrains the size of the plant. In contrast is the milkweed here, the common milkweed. I call this unconstrained modularity. They go absolutely berserk. If you go to the Allegan State Game Preserve and look at the goose management area, there are fabulous milkweed um, genets there, genetic individuals, that could have 10,000 rabbits in them, that's each of the stems. And it's all the same individual. That's bigger than any tree I know about if you've got 10,000 rabbits that are covering a hectare of, of land. So these are enormous organisms, some of them. So that has consequences for expression of effects. So this is a, um, a, a, a rabbit, a, a genet here in Kalamazoo, uh, just about a mile from here. And this is what they look like on the ground. So I got a hose and washed all the soil away. And these, these are actually, they're called rhizomes in the literature, but they're not. These are underground stems. So they've got these modified stems that go underground, and then it sends up all of these rabbits. So an individual could be huge. So I've been interested in, in the consequences of this for what the plants are doing and how the monarch butterflies use these, um, again, in time and space. Um, this is just some uh, earlier work by um, Ericsson looking at some measures of performance of monarch larvae fed on different milkweeds. So these are four different milkweed species that are familiar to many people who are interested in gardening and using native plants here in Michigan. So this is the common milkweed, this is the swamp milkweed, this is butterfly weed, and then this is a very controversial plant that um, lots of people across North America are growing because it's the easiest milkweed in the world to grow. It's Asclepius curasabica, it's also called tropical milkweed, and um, I've been growing it for just about 50 years, 
and it's an absolute cinch. You can take cuttings, you can grow it from seed, and it's wonderful to grow. It's very attractive. And lots of people um, are growing it and feeding monarchs on it, but it's an invasive species. It's from the Caribbean and northern South America, and it's the most abundant milkweed in South America. So it shouldn't be here in North America. So growing it is a mistake, and I, I, I don't really have time to explain the mistake, but if, if you want to ask me why at the end, I'll tell you. Um, so this is just indicating measure, measures of performance here, things like how much nitrogen there is, the assimilation efficiency, and the efficient, efficiency of conversion of the ingested matter. These green values are the highest for all of these comparisons. So you can see that the common milkweeds are pretty good host plant for monarchs to use. They're doing pretty well on it. Um, this value is highest for pure sabbatical, which is the efficiency of conversion of the digestive matter. So it's, a, it's, a, um, it's not a very tough, leathery, hairy milkweed like the common milkweed is here. This one has pretty easy to eat leaves. That's why this value is helpful. Whereas butterfly weed, which many people like to grow because it's so attractive, um, is not a particularly good host plant for monarchs. So I'm just showing you this to give you some idea of the variation among all these different host plants and that everything's not equal. Um, these are just some pictures of some of other problems that monarchs have. Um, latex. So milkweeds are called, late, uh, called milkweeds because of this milky latex. This is the first instar larva. So what the larva does when it hatches out of the egg here is it turns around and eats the egg. And this triggers the production of mixed function oxidases in the gut of the larva, and it can start dealing with its food. Now the most dangerous thing that a monarch larva ever does in its entire life is to plunge its mouth parts through the epidermis of a leaf to try and get at the leaf material to eat. So what they do is, first of all, they shave the plant. So this is a scanning electron micrograph that we took of a common milkweed leaf, and they've eaten all the hairs away here, shaved it, and all of this is silk that they've spun. And they do this so that when they do this and plunge their mouth into the leaf, if they break into a latex channel and get a face full of glue, it can be bigger than the size of their head. It's a great big ball of glue that comes out. <laughs> and what do you do? So this larva here is, is going like this and like this, and it's rubbing its mouth parts on the leaf to try and get rid of the latex. But when they've got this silk, they can also leap off the leaf dangle from the silk and then gradually come back up the silk thread back onto the bead to get away from the latex. So this is clearly a very dangerous thing to do and latex varies enormously among all the different species. So again, this is influencing the choices the butterflies are making it as they move through time and space to try and make sure that the offspring do really well. So this is a bit of a nerdy way to ask some these questions, but so the adults are are integrating all scales, time and space, and um, they need to do is resolve pair of offspring conflict. So those of you with children, like my three sons, know what a pain in the neck they are, <laughs> and how expensive they are. You know, anybody who's paid tuition, college tuition, it's, it's disgusting. I know it's, it's funded me all my career, but it's just boy, it just keeps getting worse and worse. So we're all trying to resolve pair of offspring conflict. So monarch butterflies are trying to do this by being conspicuously apismatic. This just means warningly colored. So these, this is a monarch and uh, this is a queen. And so the monarch butterfly is brightly colored. This blue jay in a um, Scientific American cover uh, picture uh, written by Lincoln Brower. This blue jay is trying to discriminate between these and it's choosing this one because it's less toxic than this one because this one is thought to be a mimic of this one. So that's what I mean by apismatism. The butterflies are sequestering these cardinalides, these toxic steroids. And they're using this bright coloration during mate choice in what we call, in ecologists call enemy free space. So you're, you're trying to enter this space where there are no natural enemies because you're telling them you can't eat me because I'm too poisonous. And so you've entered this enemy free space. And so that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to convince everybody that they're absolutely invulnerable, you know, a bit like Donald Trump in Washington. And, uh, and you know, there's a certain apisemitism about him, really. Um, and so some females have very little defense. So some females may be actually mimicking males, which I'll come back to in just a minute. Um, uh, but they can have very high cardenomite contents 
in their bursts of copulatory. So the females store male sperm, but there are a lot of nutrients with that. And so the female could make herself more toxic and lay more toxic eggs, even though she's not toxic, because she's mated with a really good male who's got lots of toxins to give to her. So there are all sorts of interesting dynamics with what's going on with the butterflies. So we asked some questions about um, post-plant choice and wing color. We were thinking that maybe this may help us explain why monarchs are flying such enormous distances to choose particular milkweed species. So if you look at the, the color of male wings and female wings, you can see there are differences. The male wings pop out at you more. And part of that is because there's a lot of, well, there are the black scales on the wing veins on the females more than in the males. But we actually found that there are significant differences in the, the colors of the wings. So we asked whether host plant influences wing color. And is there a difference between male and female wing color? And is there a link between chemical defenses and wing color in butterflies that might explain migration to find very high value um, milkweed resources? So um, a student might have Matt Dayton and reared monarchs in Missouri on these two milkweeds where they overlap in Missouri. And these, we think, are the two most important host plants for monarch butterflies in North America. And we measured the sequestered cardenolites. The omicrones, monarch wing color is produced by omicrones. Um, these are eye pigments. So Drosophila has omicrones in their eyes. And um, that is a visual pigment. And monarchs have co-opted that whole system to make their wings bright orange. And, um, and we also measured color. I'm, I'm not going to give you a little data here. I'm just going to sort of reach a conclusion about this. So Matt reared them on the two milkweeds. So these are the cardenolides in the wings and in the bodies of the butterflies. And you see on virilis, the southern milkweed, they have much more toxin than on soraka, the common milkweed up here. So this is what we expected, that big difference. And um, so to answer this question, basically, these omicrones, we did HPLC, we did color analyses and things like this, and we compared these two groups of butterflies from the two host plants. Um, we found that the omicrones are based on tryptophan, and this seems to uncouple, uncouple monarchs from a need for plant-derived pigments. So they can get tryptophan from any milkweed, and they don't need to have a specific chemical precursor for, for the colors. And this allows them to manipulate their own color through evolution, independent of host plants. Um, the females do differ significantly from the males, so this orange in the males is different from the orange in the females. And the cost of sex, it's expensive to produce males. Um, males are basically useless, they're just sperm donors and sperm are cheap. Eggs are the expensive thing, that's where the action is, that's what's important. And so having lots of males around is an expensive thing to do from an evolutionary point of view. And so to balance those costs, we think that the males, the males may be balancing these costs by acting as brighter, more saturated, self-mimetic, auto-mimetic color models for females. So this is a model for a mimetic female. The females have to be as poisonous as the male. The male's bigger, has a brighter signal, warns birds that it's toxic, and the females benefit from the males sacrificing themselves to bird education. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm, I'm just going to go through a little bit about the chemical defense and variation. These are different milkweed species here. Um, this is the northern milkweed, and these are the butterfly con the cardenolite content of the butterflies. So um, they uh, basically these southern milkweeds produce butterflies that are an order of magnitude more toxic than the northern butterflies. So is there a, a problem for monarch butterflies doing that? Um, feeding on the northern milkweed, which makes them much less toxic than feeding on the southern milkweeds. Well, they can't stay and set up because it gets too toxic, so you've got to go north. So they don't really have much option. So um, they do seem to be able to compensate for that, those differences to some degree. And what we did here is we reared butterflies from different milkweeds and plotted the butterfly colour line against the plant colour line they were reared on. And you get this asymptotic relationship which suggests that there's an upper limit to how much of the poison the butterflies have in their bodies. Um, but it also suggests that some species, they're able to increase their toxicity 
sort of um, by putting lots of the plant material through their bodies and sequestering what they need. And that's shown here by Sleepy Sarai for the common milkweed as the highest ratio of butterfly cut in life to plant cut in life of any of these species. And so they're sequestering from the common milkweed here in, in Michigan more efficiently than any other milkweed in North America. So it looks like this strong evolutionary pressure for the butterflies to sequester as efficiently as possible on this super abundant, highly modular milkweed up here in the Great Lakes region. So we think this is evidence for a very strong association between monarchs and the common milkweed. So what happens during the year is um, this represents time on this axis here, and this is the butterfly defense. And these are all butterflies as you, we're moving through time and looking at their defense, all these different phases. This is overwintering. This is the first migration to the southern USA. This is breeding in the southern USA. This is the next migration of those butterflies to the northern USA, to the Great Lakes. This is breeding in the Great Lakes region. This is the autumn migration south. And then this is the start of overwintering um, towards the end of November. And so you get this fluctuation of butterflies. So these represent the cardenolides of the host plants that they feed on um, in, in North America. These are in the southern USA. So these are Sleepus viridis, Asperula, and Humistrata. And then this is Sleepus syriaca. So these represent the butterflies that were reared on these. So these butterflies are all very toxic, having fed on all of these. These butterflies are surprisingly toxic, having fed on the, the common milkweed. And that's an indication of their efficiency of sequestration. So these are very well defended. But then something weird happens to them. They lose their defense as they age. And I don't know if you remember, I showed you a picture of more cardenolite in the wings. We think the cardenolites are associated with the wing scales. And so as they age and lose wing scales, um, this may account for this drop in cardenolite here as they're aging, as they migrate to the south. And then when they get to Mexico, they're relatively poorly protected. And this dashed line represents a predation threshold where um, uh, orioles and grosbeaks and also mice eat the butterflies in the overwintering colonies. So if you have 100 million overweight butterflies all sitting in the trees in Mexico, that's a tremendous resource for birds and mice to eat, and so they attack them. And this predation threshold sort of recognizes that they're, they're right at that tipping point of still being defended. So I'm just going to shift to um, talking a little bit about nectar resources. And this represents the nectar resources that the monarchs are exploiting. Um, a whole load of asteraceae, a lot of um, daisy type plants, particularly asters, myatris, um, goldenrod, things like this. Um, some clovers and some verbenas down here. And uh, what we find when monarchs are moving south is that their physiology changes. So the, the um, day length triggers a different physiology. And um, they stop mating and then they start feeding. And when they start feeding on these flowers, taking in nectar, they turn that nectar into fat, and the butterflies become progressively obese. By the time you reach the Mexican border, the butterflies are like huge, massive, great big fat lumps. <laughs> and, um, so this is indicating the fall migration in Massachusetts. This represents the uh, uh, frequency distribution of the amount of fat in the butterflies. So you get these skinny butterflies in Massachusetts, fat butterflies in central Texas a little bit later, so this is a few weeks later. And then the middle of the overwintering, they've lost some of their, their fat, and then later wintering, they've lost them more. So their fat is here, and gradually lose fat. So that sequestered fat from the flower nectar is what fuels them for six months hanging out on those trees. They arrive at the end of November and leave at the end of March. So that six month period, is all driven by how much fat they get from those flowers. Um, this is, I, I just put this up because a lot of people in Michigan are interested in growing milkweeds for monarchs. Um, these are all Michigan milkweeds here. And this is a wonderful paper that was published in 1891. It's always driven me nuts with, with students in my classes have said, oh yeah, I'm only accessing any literature in the last 10 years because everything before that is worthless. That just never has been true and never will be true. So 1891, this is a great paper. 
And all these data came from the, the paper in terms of all these different insect groups um, uh, using these different plants. So these are genera and species in these different insect groups. And you can see some of these plants, like the common milkweed, have lots of bees and wasps and butterflies visiting them. Um, this is a really nice milkweed that's quite common in Michigan and has lots of flies and bees and wasps visiting. So migration is enabling these adults to locate different host plants in time and space through the spring water migration and then also to fuel their migration with nectar from these plants. Um, the, um, migration also enables them to survive natural enemies by accessing high value milkweeds that gives them chemical defenses and to survive abiotic conditions, leave the lethally hot um, south and make it to the benign north. The larvae require nutrition, they need to be able to handle the milkweed defenses, and they need to sequester cut in lines for defense. So last year I published um, a review of all the threats to monarch butterflies, and this is just summarizing the annual cycle of the butterflies from overwintering through spring migration to generate this first generation here. So the, this represents this, this map is, represents the same latitudes at the same time here. Yeah. So this um, is the first generation and then the subsequent three generations up here, which is indicated here. And now with climate change, there are, there's a swamp milkweed called Scritus perennis in the southern USA, which is generating a fifth generation. And so there's more and more breeding in, um, in um, Panhandle, Florida, southern Georgia, places like that. Um, in the autumn, which is, um, uh, we don't really know the significance of that. And then they carry on migrating south to Mexico to spend the winter here in Mexico. Um, this is just a summary of the same thing, but also including California and monarchs that overwinter along the coast of California. So what's happening to monarchs? Um, in Mexico, the numbers overwintering, this is in millions, are so going from half a billion butterflies roughly, um, decreased precipitously up to the present time. And the same thing in California, perhaps even more dramatically in California. So losing huge numbers of monarchs in the overwintry sites. And um, the likely reasons for these declines are the loss of milkweeds from genetically modified crops, pesticides and fertilizers, and the loss of natural resources from these same causes, so losing the two kinds of resources the butterflies are using from the use particularly of herbicides. Um, pesticide toxicity to monarchs and neonicotinoids are causing problems for monarchs everywhere. Um, and the loss of wintering forests in Mexico and California. And then the impact of climate change on weather patterns, drought and temperatures, and on milkweed distributions. And then also there's the influence of invasive plants and predators like that tropical milkweed, like Vinci toxicum, which is a milkweed that's invading here at the moment. Um, that is toxic to monarch larvae, they die if, they, if the caterpillars eat it. And females will lay eggs on it. Um, Asian ladybird beetles eat the larvae of monarch butterflies. So these kinds of threats are increasing um, in North America. This just indicates from USDA data the adoption of uh, genetically engineered crops. So um, herbicide tolerant soybeans, herbicide tolerant cotton, um, <coughs> and uh, herbicide tolerant um, corn here, but also corn and cotton that's expressing bacillus thuringiensis toxins, which are um, pesticides, in, in insecticides that kill monarchs as well, because they're targeting agriculture. And so you've got this huge adoption, pretty much um, all of the crops that are grown around here are um, genetically modified crops. And this is the new threat. Um, this is a field of soybean with amaranthus in it in Missouri. And amaranthus is the new superweed. There are three species of amaranthus which are now resistant to all the currently used um, herbicides, things like glyphosate, Roundup. And so these superweeds are going absolutely berserk in the fields that are sprayed with herbicides. And so now Monsanto, I gave a talk at Monsanto about three years ago um, about this issue, and they were talking about their new constructs they're going to make, because now you can use CRISPR for gene editing get all sorts of sophisticated expression in plants, and now they can get these plants expressing resistance to different physiological pathways in the plants to multiple cocktails of herbicides. So you, you can target three different pathways at the same time 
and there isn't a plant in the face of the planet that can withstand that kind of onslaught. So if the crops are resistant to that, plants like that, but everything around the field will be gone, there will be, will be another plant anyway. Um, they're very careful with how they spray it, obviously. So they, they want to solve this problem. And so that's where we're headed, is towards these super technologies that control weeds. Then in Mexico, there's this, it has been this issue. So my dear friend, Lee Cabrera, who died last year, sadly, um, he published this paper in 2016, showing the extent of overwintering forest. The, the butterflies spend the winter in 12 locations in Mexico, and most of it's protected by the Monarch Butterfly Bi Biosphere Reserve, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And this is inside the MBDR. And so this range here has been illegally cut by the foresters coming in, and it's been a big problem with organized crime, stealing trees from this particular reserve. And this star here is this location here. So these are all monarch butterflies at this overwintering location. So Lincoln has long been very concerned about these, these kinds of issues. So what responses have there been to these monarch declines? Um, there's a 2014 petition for endangered species protection of monarch butterflies. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of citizen science in North America that's engagement throughout the country to enhance monarch resources, planting regionally relevant milkweeds, planting native nectar flowers, and the creation of monarch way stations based on this website from their advice on Chip Taylor at the University of Kansas. And the presidential initiative, um, uh, Barack Obama, um, with Harper and Peña Nieto in Mexico at the time, um, uh, had this initiative to protect monarchs and wild pollinators. And now plans are under development in Midwestern states, in the regions, particularly in the corn grain regions, where milkweeds have been so important to monarch butterflies, and we're losing them through the use of pesticides. So will this work? Um, the basic issue is, will the farm bill that came out a year ago uh, protect nature in agroecosystems? Does nature have to function as a weak compromise to agricultural policy? Or can we have economic development that is compatible with protection of ecosystem services? And from, I attended lots of state meetings here in Michigan, it looks like the USDA, <coughs> EPA, and the seed and chemical companies, including Monsanto, Dow, AgroSciences, BASF, Bayer Crop Science, DuPont, Blue Farm, Syngenta, and Bluefield United, they're all waiting to see how they should respond. And when I asked Monsanto, what should, you know, how are they going to respond? They basically said, we respond to squeaky wheels. And so you, you've got to make noise. You have to start kicking up a fuss, get public opinion on, on your side. It's a bit like the impeachment. The impeachment won't go ahead if the public don't start responding. This is the same issue. If the public don't respond to losing milkweeds and, and nectar sources, then nothing will happen. And so, you do need these grassroots movements to try and mobilize to, to respond to issues that are important to everybody in the country. So um, the monarchs, basically the bottom line is they won't become extinct, but their migration may be altered radically. Um, climate change can result in drastic changes to the overwintering forests. Although this is a picture of an overwintering monarch after a snowstorm in Mexico, they're becoming less and less common the snowstorms. And I don't know if anybody's read Flight Behavior by Barbara Kingsall, a fairly recent novel of hers. She was um, suggesting that monarchs could start overwintering in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, the, the Smokies or somewhere like that. And this is a possibility. It might happen. There may be an evolutionary shift that can do that. So um, I don't really have time, I don't think, Mike, do I, to, to talk about South American monarchs? you got two minutes, I think. Two minutes. <laughs> I've just got a couple of pictures here I can show you just for comparison. So um, the sun monarch is a different species, but it's basically identical. It's called the Nancy Rippers. We've been working in Bolivia and Argentina asking questions about whether it migrates in South America. Um, this represents the diversity of milkweeds. And this is South America. All the blue is North America. The green there is South America. It's a horrible way to show it, but it kind of 
of makes the point. There are lots of Asclepia species, 130 here in North America, and there are possibly 12 in South America, and only seven are available to monarchs in South America. So 130 versus seven. So it interested us, these are monarch larvae in, in Bolivia feeding on two different crop leaves. Um, it's identical to the monarch in North America, except this edge here is orange. In North American monarchs, it's black. That's the only difference. Um, and um, this picture is of a monarch nectaring on a eupatorium species that is a rich source of pyrimazine alkaloids, which they use um, also defensively in the adults. And these are pictures I took in Argentina in the autumn during the autumn migration when the butterflies were really fat. And these are other butterflies and, and a moth that were migrating with them. And these, and this one, and then this one are also all known to sequester pyrimidine alkaloids. So it's not just nectar they need, they also need other chemical defenses to help protect them against natural enemies. And so what we think is happening in South America, this is the, this is the geographical map, these are watersheds. So this is the main watershed in Bolivia. This watershed drains up to the Amazon, and this watershed drains down here to the plate, down the Pure Gross Islands. And so this separation here, which is very close to the Bolivia-Argentina border, separates these monarchs from these ones. These ones we think do elevational <coughs> migration using rivers to go up and find high value nobles at high elevation. These ones are using the Yungus forest, that's what this shaded region represents, to move up and down the eastern cordillera of the Andes to um, exploit milkweeds that are growing there, but also to find those um, high value nectar reserves. Thank you very much. No, no, they can't. Um, so Anorak Agarana Cornell has shown that there are some kind of lights in the nectar, um, but they're just going to go through the gut of the butterfly and they're not going to become incorporated in those tissues. The, the cardin lights are, um, are not found in fat tissue. They're, they're very hydrophilic and hyperphobic um, in the So they're not in fat. There may be a little bit associated with muscle, but most of it is with this is simply a mechanism for an adult to enhance its toxicity by sequestering nectar and from the Yes? Very briefly, the North American monarch, does it migrate during daylight hours or, not, or nocturnal? And at what altitude do they migrate? So um, they migrate during the day, only during the day. They, they stop and form bivouacs or roost inside the sleep on their way down. So that, on, on the sort of migration routes, if you, if you look down the Mississippi Valley, you can find places in Missouri and southern Illinois where you'll find clusters of butterflies hanging on trees in the autumn, um, uh, waiting for the morning. In the morning, they'll often fly down 
down to um, very dewy pastures to the grass, um, drink a lot of water because they, they dehydrate, and then they take, take off and go up. And um, David Gibbo, a glider pilot in Canada, has shown that monarchs are using thermals, and they're going up in thermals to between five and 10,000 feet, and then they leave the thermals and glide tremendous long distances. And we think that the buildup of fat in their bodies helps the wing loading of the butterflies. So the physics of gliding flight is enhanced by the, the uh, enhanced wing loads through the amount of fat the butterflies have. And they just glide out of these thermals. And they can maybe glide for you know, 20, 30 kilometers before they, they, they go up in another thermal and keep on doing this. So it seems to be a very efficient way for them to move south. Yes? What importance is it to human species? What's 